So welcome everybody for the first in a series of Forest School lunchtime talks. It's uh, really nice to have you all here. It's a really exciting turnout. We have uh, <clears throat> started this program of Forest School of the Forest School um, at the beginning of this year to really explore what would it look like if a design school, or a art and design school, starts uh, the journey of education by looking at a living system and using forest uh, as a starting point to, to venture into. So today is the first of uh, 10 uh, lunchtime lectures that are taking place across uh, this term and the next term until June uh, in, bi weekly every other week. And ooh, how do I go forward? And maybe the first thing to say is uh, to correct the title. Uh, as was pointed out to me quite rightly, of course, nature culture uh, should lose the forward slash. It's a term coined by Donna Haraway, really to kind of um, stop the distinction between nature and culture. Culture is human and nature is human. So that leads me quite nicely uh, into what we're discussing today. We have two speakers, which we'll introduce later. And we've also invited graduates uh, from the MA in architecture at Centers in Arts uh, to contribute via two films, uh, or, or more precisely one film and one um, uh, radio broadcast at the end. So maybe to kind of set the tone, I think it's quite good to remember that this is not, this is a school and it's not necessary lectures. So uh, maybe some slightly different protocols apply. Um, feel free to interject. It's a space of learning and inquiry. It's quite open. It's uh, hopefully a space for experimentation, for professional uh, opinions, as well as those so just starting on the journey. So please evoke the, not only the nature of the school, but also that of the forest as we venture through these lunchtime talks. Today, we have uh, a really wonderful lineup. We are gonna kick off with a short film, uh, news segment by Aborescent News, um, looking into the future. Um, then we uh, have uh, architect Hester Buck talking about her research into moss and curator Gili Karjewski from Berlin talking about her curational work um, with the floating university in Berlin. And uh, we have time, they should each take 10 minutes. We have time for Q and A and then we have a radio segment, which is 20 minutes, which we play on. So if you're working in an office, um, then you can have it on in the background. I would also like to welcome and thank our partners in this project. Uh, the, the, the Forest School is an initiative that comes out of the MA in Architecture at Central St. Martins, but it's also linked to the knowledge exchange work we do. And we are really keen to build uh, long-term partnerships in the space with uh, organizations. So we have received a very kind support from White Architecta uh, in Malmö in Sweden, and also working with uh, Forestry England. Uh, and uh, you will, as we progress to the series, you will hear their voices as well. So kind of thank you and welcome. And, um, just maybe on the last note before I hand over to Jessica to play the film. Um, we have a website where we collect all the different activities that are taking place around the forest school and where we're also uploading um, these the recordings of this session, along with background resource, resource material, links to the speakers, and also a link to our mailing list so you can sign up and stay informed. So, um, I hand over now and I'll see you later. I hand over to Jessica if you could play the, the first film and then Hester if you kick in right afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> During today's forest talks, we'll be exploring the predicaments of caring in a nature cultural world world. Have we forgotten how to love nature? Have we forgotten what we can learn from our natural ancestors? Nature culture 
to borrow Haraway's term, is a synthesis of nature and culture that recognises their inseparability in ecological relationships that are both biophysically and socially formed. Following today's news broadcast, we'll be joined by Gilly Kodjeski, who will present two projects that illustrate the way self-organised groups come together that really reshape our bonds with nature. Followed by a presentation by Hester, exploring the embodied experience of <sighs> breathing, vital to moths and human survival. Can we construct common ground for caring with the troubled atmosphere? Finishing the today's talk, we have a botanical radio transmission hosted by Cameron. All in today's Forest Talk series. Credits. and critters alike, I welcome you to Arborescent News, where we'll be discussing the most current intergalactic forest headlines from the deep past, present and future. I am but a humble time traveller. I have witnessed the horrors of human civilization, but also the beauty of coming together to live with and for a damaged world. I join you today to tell you you're all going to die if you don't sort your shit out. We are but a speck in the life of Earth's 4.5 billion years, but the most prominent force in the reckoning of our future and the destruction of our past. The mass extinction of plant and animal species is unlikely to recover for 10 million years. You are becoming an unkindness of ghosts who will haunt our future indefinitely. But alas, <laughs> we come here together, hand in virtual hand, leaf to virtual leaf, as recognisers and champions of learning from the importance of our past, the sharing of knowledge passed down from our ancestors, which also include our other than human kin. Here is your one minute arboreal news update. Refugees are on the move in forests across western US as climate conditions change, a range of tree species are shifting, especially towards cooler, wetter and higher sites at an average rate of almost five feet per year. What did you do with your Christmas tree? Where did you source it from? Over 10 million trees are produced and cut each year between Europe and US. They are typically fir trees. If not disposed of properly, the tree will decompose and produce methane. The survival of over 200 species of conifers face extinction due to deforestation and annual cuts. I don't think they had a good Christmas. Moss viewing is on the rise in Japan the green flowerless plant that grows in moist grounds, tree trunks and rocks is usually ignored and considered a nuisance in other countries but in Japan moss is a source of endless fascination. Captured in time a pine cone giving birth to their offspring OMG! We tend to associate embryonic development while still inside the parent with animals and forget that it does sometimes occur in plants. When we meet this baby, it will be a life-changing event. I'm really looking forward to it. This pine cone is approximately 40 million years young. Encased in Baltic amber, this sheds a bit of light on the reproductive development of some of our ancestors. And finally, the weather. The earth is hot. Hot, hot, hot. It's burning. 
back to the studio. Now I shall end this short news segment with a few proverbs from the legend, Miss Lou. That's why I miss my mama, yeah. If she was alive today, all them liberty couldn't take with me, then could not say me say. She was my shield and my buckler. She was my rod and my staff. But back no know we all shot the feet. So tell all shot tear off. <laughs> you get that one? Back no know we all shot the feet. So tell all shot tear off. We never know the value of a thing until we have lost it. But true. <laughs> I will see you again week after next year. All right. This paper is brought to you by White Architects in Forest Green, England. Oh, thank you very much, Jake. Um, Aberrescent News will return in two weeks' time, but in the meantime, we hand over to Hester Buck. We have the chat open, if you uh, and possibly your microphone works as well. So please feel free to interject if you have questions um, or something else to say. Hester, thank you. Okay, hopefully the screens come up. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm Hester Buck, I'm part of uh, the Architecture and Design Collective, um, an art collective Public Works, and today I'm going to talk about a piece of research um, that's forming part of my PhD as a practice-based piece of research, um, and thinking about how we can think with MOSS as part of a participatory design practice. Um, considering how we engage with air as a material of the city through the design through a series of co-designed MOSS prototypes, which I'm exploring through reflecting on workshops and events. But today, as a quick introduction, I'm going to focus on um, why we might think with MOSS, why, why I think with MOSS, why it is an interesting species, um, and how its scientific and cultural properties have meant it's become a companion for me on my research journey. I'm not studying it from outside, I am within. I'm complicit in exploring how it captivates and transforms our relationship with air as a material. I explore it through my own interests and passions, um, and this interest and passion become a subject of my research. Um, I understand this interest through engagement with other people, with you all today. Um, the knowledge I'm going to present today has come through conversations with ecologists and biologists over the last three or four years to develop uh, the prototypes um, that are the subjects of my research. Today I'm going to present a series of facts and ideas about the qualities of mass. They're not yet coherent or a linear journey, perhaps some of this coherence can come through the discussion later. Um, yes. Oh no, it's not changing. Uh, I will try this instead. Yes. So to start with um, thinking about air and why I'm interested in air. Air is a direct and everyday connection to our global climate. It is constructed through our, uh, through our actions. As we sit in rest, we breathe, change in the nature of air. Um, to keep ourselves warm, the fuel we burn, um, changes what is suspended within their air and the infrastructure of travel and movement, how we choose to take that movement, whether on a car, a plane, in, on a bicycle, changes the air that we breathe as well. And yet it is often overlooked and um, not often a subject of architectural um, consideration and material of the architecture we design, which has not always been the case. When we look at things like Vitruvius, he talks about architecture in relation to air as an enclosure um, uh, of space creates a bubble of air and atmosphere, and which is habitable or uninhabitable. Equally, if you move forward to uh, Victorian ideas of health and well-being, the sense that poor air, my asthma causes um, disease. And when you look at the urban design of, plant, of parks within London, this was to create gaps in the miasma for people to go in and breathe this clean air. However, as the discourse around air has shifted, becoming more precise, more scientific, it has retreated from architectural discussion, fallen out of discourse, often talked about as a void, as an absence, um, and now sits within a kind of science discussion, visualised through large scale data that is obviously often collected and then relayed at a later date. Um, and citizen science is used a lot within this as a way of uh, using the public to collect large amounts of data and also engage in the data that we're showing. 
I'm going to use eco-feminist thinking, um, their um, kind of conceptualization of science and technology as a way of thinking about this science of air quality, how we might conceptualize these ideas through the plurality and embodied experience of air. So focusing on how we might think of with moss within the participatory process, but using eco-feminism as a way of defining our thinking. So to start, why moss? Moss filters air as it grows. It improves air quality. Um, so you can see on the image on the screen, this is a moss leaf. And there are a series of tiny holes all, all over that leaf, um, rigid vacuoles. These are exchanging gases. So moss isn't a vascular plant. It doesn't have roots drawing up nutrients from the ground. It's drawing that nutrients out of the air it breathes, bringing in moisture for it to grow, but also um, uh, nutrients and particles that it finds within the air. One of those key nutrients is nitrogen dioxide, NOx. This is what causes plants to go green and lush, but it's also what's produced um, by diesel cars and is one of the main pollutants within our cit cities. Um, so this, this NOx, which can trigger asthma within humans and reduce growth of lungs, um, is what means the moss is growing. So to scale out slightly more, this is looking at the front of a moss. Because um, moss doesn't have a vascular system, it has a very high surface area um, because every cell needs to be in contact with air. So you can see within the leaves, the kind of translucent leaves that are just one cell thick. This very high surface area uh, captures particulate matter, which is very fine dust suspended within our atmosphere. And the two main types of um, PM are PM 2.5, um, and PM, PM10. And this can be anything, it's just about the size, um, size of this dust which can, can get captured in your lungs. But through a process of biofiltration, moss uh, captures this dust and turns it into organic matter, thin layers of soil underneath the moss. So here you can see how the direct observation of the moss um, can tell us about the atmosphere around us. A scientific storytelling, the moss of the air, uh, the breath of the moss filters the air using science as a way of seeing, changing our perspective on the world, an embodied understanding of air through the quality of breath. While pollution can support the growth of moss, changes in air can also kill that moss. Um, so unlike soil, which we can control, moss um, is uh, subject to change. Uh, so if you move a moss from a very polluted area into an unpolluted area, so from Cardiff into the hills of Wales, that moss would struggle to survive as it comes into contact with other um, pollutants that it's not used to and vice versa. So um, the life and death of moss can be a way of reading the air quality that we're coming into contact with, understanding it in relation to the species and the pollution it encounters. <laughs> Oh, I'm interested in how we can see this dying as an educational process, see the violence of the slow violence of pollution through the growth, growth of the moss, moss, not large scale change or catastrophe, but everyday violence of pollution. The moss bears witness to our polluted atmosphere. So the most, uh, the most local moss to where you live is a moss that's best adapted to growing within your climate. So this asks us to look with care at our existing climate at our own existing environment every day and accessible, to look at the surface of the city along the texture of concrete or in the cracks between bricks, we can find the mosses best suited to cultivate for um, to improve our air quality. And this uh, cultivation creates communities of care. These, uh, this cultivation is kind of, it's unknown, it's at risk. We must return to the moss to keep it growing, to keep, uh, to see how it grows best and what what's, and not supporting its growth. Both We are both learning from one another about air quality through this, this form of growing. So using Donna Haraway's term companion species, we can see how the moss is being trained by the human to grow across the surface of a prototype um, along the edge of an architecture, but the human is being trained by the moss to think about atmosphere, the atmosphere you're creating, whether that's the level of moisture within the atmosphere or how your actions such as um, the transport you're taking is changing the pollution it, it comes um, into contact with. So here we can see this as a form of interspecies care. The breath of the moss filters the air um, as a form of more than human care. It challenges the power relationship between the person and the plant. There is an interspecies inter dependency that forms part of our stories of planetary survival. 
Um, so moss is everywhere and every day. We can find it in our immediate environment. It is not a story of large tales, tales, uh, scale change, but of noticing what is already present. Um, noticing this down to earthness of moss. It is a plant we can feel and touch, an embodied experience of a caring relationship in the discovering of how it grows. There is very little horticulture around moss or learning about how we might or should grow moss. And so as a result, a lot of my research focuses on working with groups around how we might start this cultivation. In this, there isn't a commodity chain, um, chain of uh, consumption, but instead about individual direct action. It rejects a techno fix of bringing something from outside within, but instead seeing and cultivating what already exists. So to zoom out slightly, we can also think about our climate in relation to moss. So historically, volcan volcanic eruptions where large amounts of particulate matter, fine dust, was, um, went into the air, creating inhospitable uh, climate to live within. Through this process of biofiltration, this dust became the soil which we now live on to survive. So here, here, using Anna Singh's concept of welding or world building, we can see that how our inhabitable world is co-created by the more than human, by the moss. This moss connects air and soil to current approaches to climate. So we often talk about climate change as focusing on carbon or ozone, whereas soil often talks more in terms of the supporting of life and biodiversity within. And this moss sits as the interchange between the two, thinking of both the air and of the soil. Staying with this planetary uh, scale, moss is complicit in cooling the earth. So during um, the summer, when there is low levels of moisture, large areas of moss in forests, but especially in peatland, will uh, bleach and turn white. And this is something called the Albion effect. And this bleaching reflects the heat of the sun and cools down the, the temperature of the earth. Um, and so again, we can see how you're thinking the moss asks you to think at two different scales, at the very, very small, at the particle exchange of uh, the gases that we breathe, but also at a planetary scale of, um, of temperature. And again, this is an interesting idea within eco-criticism of how do, we, how do we change our scale to think beyond this, the human. Um, as Val Plumwood uh, says, thinking through other scales of experience, the very large and the very small. Um, so moss is a pioneer species. This thin layer of soil supports other forms of growth, other plants. Um, to grow this entwining of different wildlife. It resists a plantation, the idea of a single species to solve a problem, which can often lead to disease and the exploitation of the um, qualities of minerals, the properties of a land. So finally, I want to end by thinking, reflecting on some of the contradictions, uh, the inadequacies of moss in this way of thinking. Um, using Nixon's idea of slow violence, how can we exist within a problem, bring our attention to the climate of here and now, um, not a catastrophe in the future? So situations of slow violence are often not clear cut. Yeah, they are the air quality of the everyday, the pollution we find ourselves within. And this can often have uh, can change drastically within a day. So the direction of a wind or the level of moisture within the air can change, change the nature of air pollution. It's something that needs to be constructed and reconstructed as a form of knowledge. It's not fixed or, un or simple or understood. Moss equally improves air quality. However, if the air quality were to improve to an extent that moss would no longer survive, we need to return to the trouble, return to the struggle to understand what pollutants are in the air and what moss is the best place um, to, to intervene within that situation. Um, and that encourages a form of, kind of, of environmental care. And this takes, I suppose, me full circle, my, my research full circle, having thought about moss initially as something that would solve a problem which could intervene with poor air quality. It now, I'm now more interested in how it creates a level um, of ongoing and uh, ongoing care for the environment and ongoing um, understanding of what that air might be, not as something to be solved, but something to exist within with care. And this, I think, 
is where co-production and forms of knowledge are really important when we're dealing with things that are disparate and changing fluid that have to be returned to and the importance of kind of gathering a, um, a group of care around an issue of indeterminacy such as air and air quality. Thank you. Oh, I want to clap. Thank you very much. We, you're all welcome to kind of uh, unmute yourself and to give a give a round of applause or find a digital equivalent. Uh, unless there are any, yeah, that's great. Uh, unless there are any burning questions, uh, I want to thank uh, Esther. Oh, I just opened the, the box, um, the chat box. Um, so yeah, Gilly. Um, Hester, there are lots of um, claps mm -hmm. digitally, uh, and we will hold uh, maybe the conversation until after Gilly. So, Gilly. Unless, unless there are urgent questions, I would hate to get in that way. No? Um, no. Yeah, there's one. Hi, Heather. Love how your projects feel the science and art in your experiment. Are you excluding the case, case where the moss mutates into the variety that actually thrives in an environment that is polluted or noxious to human? Or maybe it doesn't matter as such, from Sapna. You're on mute. Um, uh, yeah, so there and there are definitely species that survive in very polluted environments, um, but that thriving would decrease pollution. I mean, I suppose in a way that last element, there's kind of almost something quite utopian in the idea that we could grow enough moss that we could improve our air quality to the point where it couldn't survive anymore. Um, I suppose, um, uh, and that yeah, that it would if it was surviving and thriving, but the environment would be gradually becoming less noxious to humans. Um, but I suppose as I'm really interested recently in this idea of kind of ecological thinking of, eco, of a kind of balance and that sort of resilience of balance between different species um, and um, how that's something that always needs a kind of readdressing, a reconsideration and a recare. And that instead of some there's a sort of uh, complexity and a contradiction to how you can talk about something it's not a very simple thing to engage with but actually that's a really interesting kind of place to try and exist and try and think and talk great thank you very much um Lily. all right um this should uh, work hopefully um, so I am going to read. Um, can you see the presentation or my text? Uh, no, you've, you're sharing desktop at the moment. So right. if you start the screen share again and just select the presentation. Mm -hmm. And then bring the presentation to the foreground. Uh, there. Yep, we can now see the presentation. Right. Still? Yep. All right. Uh, so what I'm going to be uh, reading out loud now is a kind of a remix of a curatorial text that I wrote together with Rosario Talevi. We both curate together the Climate Care Festival at the Floating University Berlin. Uh, it's a festival for theory and practice on a nature culture learning site. Uh, the first edition was in 2019 and the last edition was last year and it focused on uh, rewilding, it was named the Rewilding Years. And so here we go. Floating University Berlin is a hybrid organization. It is an artist-run association, Floating FV, which sits on top of a fully functioning urban water infrastructure, a biotechno social site. This infrastructure site has been serving the Temple of Air airfields since its construction and was closed to the public for many decades, letting nature take over undisturbed, forming a third landscape or a nature culture. In 2018, the site has opened to the residents of Berlin and has since provided a place for the artistic exploration of more than human cohabitation. 
It is not a park. It is an environment where we face the concrete hybridization of construction and urban nature, their interaction and interdependencies. As an association, we understand our role not as simple tenants of the basin space, but as stewards and caretakers of the different life forms that inhabit it. Emerging from weather in the conditions of the site, the program we put together in the association is a collaboration between the constructed water infrastructure, its human culture, and its biodiversity. It is simple to see how our present has been beneficial for the diverse life forms on the site. Look at the edges of the building and you will see plants growing along them in greater numbers than in the open center of the basin. By slowing the water down, our disturbances in the form of temporary and mobile architectures, walking, growing edible plants, or studying the site, have supported the buildup of sediment in the basin. When water slows down, sediments, particles of sand, silt, and clay, falls out of it. In this sediment, plant, plants can root and take hold to create habitat for frogs to procreate, baby ducks to be born, and foxes to hunt. Um, the plants can also slow to water. interrupt. We're still on the slide of the woman in the pink jumpsuit. Is that meant to be the case? I think not. Is it still stuck? We're now on a, oh, we were on a picture of a book. We're now on a picture of a landscape right. and two people walking. All right, um, it should play. Is it moving? Uh, it is moving now as you click through. Great. I'm not clicking through, it should play by okay. itself. <laughs> All right, so remember the water has been slowing down around the architectures of the site, which uh, perhaps now you can see better. Um, and the plants also slow the water down, enabling more sediment to build up and more plants to grow. The cycle is co-constituting. An algae is another entity in the basin that contributes to the buildup of the mud. After floods, algae can bloom in thick mats. When the water drains out of the basin into the Landwehr Canal and the Spree River, the algae dries up and integrates into the mud as organic matter, broken down by microorganisms. The mud you see in the basin is a product of our disturbances working in tandem with the reed plants, thyme, algae, and the original engineering of the basin as a holding place for water when floods come. The cattail reed beds have tripled in size since our inhabitation of the site. And we can see new plants taking hold and old ones multiplying. Young baby willow trees are now taking root in the center of the concrete basin. We believe this constructed wetland is in the process of trans transitioning into a grassland and eventually perhaps even into a humid forest. This habitat is shifting away from aquatic plants and towards grasses, purslane, and willow trees that are now showing up. Human disturbances and interventions, such as the floating of fowls activities and passivities, working in tandem with the self-will of the Bergenian grassland, could one day become a small, naturally generated forest, a very rare thing in Berlin. Since the activation of this site in 2018, things have changed. Activities are still heavily restricted under the coronavirus pandemic, and the formats we can host on site have been reshaped as a result. The pandemic also has reshaped our conversations on care and climate and their intersection. In addition, last year, we learned of the plans to renaturalize or rewild the basin, proposed by our landlord, Tempelhof Projekt GmbH, the state-owned company that manages the site. This could mean, for example, that the thick concrete floor will be removed and replaced with a porous layer to allow incoming polluted rainwater to filter into the ground. Of course, this kind of action is not only technical. This will deeply affect both the biodiversity on site, the social use of it, and our ability to fill it with cultural programming. So the future of the site after the intervention is unclear. However, the process is still open and has the potential to be defined collaboratively. An urban transformation process such as this one is a learning process. 
and therefore should include social and pedagogical components that allow legibility, assimilation, and participation. The basin's rewilding process holds the potential for an urgently needed mediation around eco-social renewal of urban infrastructure site in ways that expose how cities are made and maintained and how they respond to the current climatic breakdown and pandemic realities. Could the rewilding process explore the relationship between urban nature and urban infrastructure by establishing a dialogue between artists, academics, engineers, gardeners, and technocrats to prototype different possible systems on site? We believe that dismantling these artificial divisions between forms of practice, artistic, academic, scientific, civic, governmental, should be at the center of this dialogue. The cluster concept that we seek for floating is one that holds the site and its biological diversity, the association and its cultural diversity, the Berlin context and situation all in one bag. To be on site is to be connected to the larger context of Berlin. To think of rewilding in this specific city is to allude to empty spaces of post-war, pre-war Berlin when unprecedentedly large areas of free space meant subversive botanical and cultural subcultures could grow in the cracks, a period known as the wild years. This wildness was the result of a particular set of conditions, a sudden regime collapse, an absence of a consolidated state, a city in a slow process of reunification, and an incredible amount of space, um, available from Second World War bomb sites to empty apartments abandoned by fleeing East Germans. Wildness was also what characterized the unique subcultures and nightlife that emerged, exploring, seizing, and inhabiting those now free spaces. But while the party was going wild, so was a neoliberal urban development agenda. Berlin being poor but sexy, in order to resolve its city debt, had an urgent need for capital. And so 14 million square meters of Berlin's public land and empty real estate were so, whoops. Uh, Gilly, the slides weren't moving through, so I'm just gonna click through them whilst you talk if that's all right. Yeah. Which slide should we be on? Sure, should I stop my sharing? Uh, it has stopped, so this is now my screen. All right. Which slide would you like us to be on? It doesn't matter. Okay. Choose one you like, Jessica. Uh, so between 2001 and 2013, um, a lot of open uh, space in Berlin was sold for a total of 2.4 billion euros. As a result, today, free spaces in the city have become increasingly scarce and the number of displaced residents have soared. In response, a number of citizen-led movements have emerged. But despite these efforts, the feeling remains. Berlin has lost its wildness. Wild urban lives have been tamed by higher rents, an absence of a caring policy for public lands, enclosures, and privatization. Profit-driven city making has displaced the wildness and ushered in waves of gentrification. We want to connect with those wild years and reflect on what Berlin and its inhabitants can learn from them. Can we reclaim wildness and rewilding as an attitude to shape our cities and our lives? Can qualities such as openness, otherness, togetherness, joyfulness, playfulness, without romanticizing the past, bring us together to foster bonds and interconnectedness on both the local and planetary scales? More recently, rewilding has been introduced in cities' Green New Deals as a strategy to help downsize the production of CO2 and therefore mitigate climate breakdown. Sometimes these efforts include interventions such as green envelopes, roofs and facades, vertical farming, wildlife corridors, urban gardens, and the planting of trees, or just allowing nature to regenerate. These are welcome efforts, but rewilding should not just be understood and implemented in a reductionist way. Rewilding efforts should be always paired with social and climate justice efforts and is therefore a plea for the systemic changes that those require, rather than the solution-oriented approach that continues to drive capitalism, even if it is tinted green. Thank you. Thank you so much.
uh, the slides have started to move. They're so enjoyable. So we, maybe we can linger with them a little bit longer. Yeah. Apologies. So wel for welcome to the landscape of Floating University Berlin. If there are any questions, I'm happy for the slides to continue while they come up. Yeah, that may be a good moment to open it up to the floor. If there are any questions, please unmute yourself or put them in the chat um, while we enjoy the slides. Hi, can I ask a question? I can't really turn my camera on, um, yeah. but if that's OK. Um, yeah. Hi, um, thanks, Gilly, for the wonderful presentation. I found it extremely interesting lot of overlaps with my own work. I think I have two major questions. One is you talk about the porous layer. So the kind of layer allows porosity of the water interacting with the foundation. So what are the kind of architectural, I guess, techniques, methodologies uh, you have applied to allow this kind of layer of breathing? Um, the second question is you talk a lot, a lot about the wireless porous wall. So um, I'm wondering if there are any kind of debris post-war that you discovered alongside, that you interacted with. There were look, look, I think it looked like found objects from one of the slides. So I wonder if there's kind of impact from either industrial aspect or the kind of war aspect um, of the kind of after effects that you have to kind of incorporate into the floating university. Um, Sorry, I think I have a third question, but maybe I'll let you answer the first two. Um, That's okay. You have time. Um, I can't see who is speaking, so maybe you can tell me your name. Yeah, um, it's uh, my name is Feifei Zhou. I, um, I edited Fair Atlas with Anna Singh, Jennifer Diga, Alden Kellum Saxena, um, kind of digital research project on the Anthropocene. Yeah, sorry, I can't turn the camera on, but... That's okay, hello. Okay, nice, you should nice be able to join now. us. I've just changed the settings. Okay. So hello and nice that you join us. Um, for the first... Hi, Feifei. Now I can see you. Hi. Um, for the first questions, there we have not uh, gone through the process yet. So right now it is an old school cement um, basin, water retention basin. And because it was built as part of the infrastructure of the Tempelhofer airfield, um, it has been there since the late 20s, beginning of the 30s as is. So it, did, it wasn't, this specific basin was not part of this um, post-war um, sites that were bombed in uh, debris. The, there is no post-war debris there. Um, I think the slide that you're referring to is actually uh, baked hives that we have created in the first edition of the festival to accommodate different insects um, um, as edible homes. Um, as some of the techniques that we're exploring of desealing um, and also transforming uh, the basin into a, something that is called the Neptune pool. I don't know if you know this. Um, we're exploring together with local uh, engineering companies. So we have an artist on site that is called Catherine Ball, who has been ar artist in residence for water filtration and infiltration at the floating university since 2018. And she's working in tandem with a local engineering company called Polyplan um, to find the correct solution. But since nobody is asking us what the solution should be, what it includes, what kind of landscaping can still accommodate for the kind of social and cultural hybridization that we imagine for the site, um, we don't know exactly what the technique that will be used to refurbish the basin is. And also it's really interesting to try and understand the incentive here. So there is a very strong financial incentive, right? Because the water that is coming into the water basin is going into the Landwehr Canal and from there into the Spree River is not filtered at the moment. And because it's considered polluted, even though it's not very highly polluted, um, it costs a lot of money for the managing company to run the water uh, on a monthly basis through these um, water systems of Berlin. Um, but they also claim uh, to have sustainability and other kind of incentives that we maybe are a bit um, 
uh, not exposed to, let's say. Um, and the second question, can you repeat it, please? Sure, I think you kind of touch based on some part of the second question, which is about the impact of the war. Um, I think it kind of linked to another very small question and see in a chat kind of talking about the way widening. So maybe we can combine the question a little bit. Um, yeah. For me, the kind of rewidening is such an interesting word because also we're talking about a place that kind of had this history of being destroyed. So what is really kind of wild is something I guess for us to, to determine, but also not to determine. So I guess my question is, obviously there's constructed efforts in terms of the building of the architecture, um, in, term, in terms of plantation or um, all these kind of um, techniques. And what are these kind of unforeseen or like unexpected effects you observed? Say you created something and something else kind of happened and felt like that was kind of the beauty of widening in that process. So is there anything you kind of didn't expect to see, but the architecture brought in a second layer of the influence. Yeah. Yes, totally. And the question from John, maybe we add it to your question as you suggested. Um, hi, John, nice to see you too. Um, is there in any sense at all to the way city governments talk about rewilding? I don't know if there's sense to anything that governments are talking about. Uh, is there a fundamental conflict between centralized democracy and the idea of implementing wildness? Very good question, very difficult question. Um, I think we understand uh, rewilding or the concept of wild as something that is very open, uh, that is, we're looking for kind of a relational understanding of this concept. So to begin with, it's a cluster concept. So it holds within it many other concepts, perhaps sometimes also contradicting ideas on what kind of approach towards uh, rewilding we can have. There's a, um, a much debated spectrum between zero human disturbance and absolute government of rewilding processes where we in reinsert species or um, uh, do certain landscape uh, activities that is completely constructed and um, um, how do you say, uh, very uh, designed. Um, and so this spectrum requires a relational approach to case by case scenarios. So whatever environments you're dealing with should um, bring about specific and relational and contextual and situational solutions. Um, so to say that rewilding is one approach would to begin with be a problematic understanding of what rewilding is and what it can offer. Um, I think a very interesting part of the program for the last edition of the festival was the contribution from Sandra Jasper, who together with Matthew Gandhi were, uh, wrote this book called The Botanical City, but also did a really, really amazing documentary about the, exactly this narrative arch of the wild years and open spaces of Berlin, this field of urban botany that was identified after the war, um, main actor of this scene is uh, Herbert Sukop, that maybe you know, um, who is also interviewed in the documentary and is uh, ending the documentary by saying, we have learned because they're talking about the open spaces of Berlin, which in German are called Brachen, um, and how uh, a new kind of botany, a new kind of urban nature, natural botanical species have emerged and have been since been classified and kind of um, yeah, re researched in different ways. And he says about the, the attempt to try and protect these new natures or these new urban natures, sorry, the vocabulary here is <laughs> impossible, um, that they learn that um, no matter who is in power and whatever site is being compromised. They have learned that nature will always return. So there's like an acknowledgement that no matter what a government says, there is kind of like a, a non-religious higher power, let's say. Um, so I don't know if that... Yeah, for sure. Like I think I'm risking some noise and but hello, it's nice to talk a little Hi. bit in real life. Um, 
it's yeah it's really interesting to think about these issues of kind of protecting wildness and whether that automatically takes away a certain self-determination or you kind of when something has self-determination within boundaries that have been defined by an external kind of agent you know kind of you have to really question um the limits of that kind of in that agency um i was also asked by someone yesterday like do i know any successful rewilding projects and it really suddenly made me think like God, it's such a weird idea to think about success in relation to rewilding as well and a strange concept because um this is a slight plug uh like we there's a story a short story we commissioned at Teatro Mundi from a author called Sophie McIntosh uh, for a book called Concrete and Ink and it was all about thinking forward um, but you know thinking the future of a specific places but in between utopia and dystopia or kind of exploring the like tension between those concepts sorry <laughs> And uh, I'll try and be quick. And basically, like, she wrote a story about a city that kind of um, becomes abandoned and becomes kind of, you know, taken over by nature, this kind of classic image we, we kind of have, and we have some real examples of it, I suppose, in the world. But what she does really successfully is kind of like, you know, these scientists go into it, and it's a place you can go and visit and explore, but it's like very difficult to tell in the story whether it's a total disaster or like, an incredible thing that's happened and I think that's the interesting thing and it's kind of the classic thing within within kind of like post-industrial cities this rewilding is always associated with a kind of collapse or um, a, a massive failure of something or a kind of like emptying out of something but then it kind of becomes this utop potential utopia or possible utopia or whatever so yeah really I think the ideas of success and implementation and and all of this kind of stuff that's so important to urbanism is completely antithetical in, in a lot of ways to these ideas of wildness. So it's an interesting kind of tension in some of the current discourse. Yeah, and, and it's again the tension between the physical environment and the actions within this physical environment and the processes, the natural processes, and then the way we narr narrate them, tell these stories, factualize them. Uh, there is an amazing, and I think these this tension is constant within everything that we do, the way we talk about it and the physical uh, phenomena that we relate to. Um, there is an amazing, amazing talk by Mackenzie Wark for the Riga, Riga Biennale that I highly recommend about ficting and facting uh, that talks about this nature. It's like science gives us the fact and the fiction gives us the stories through which we talk about these facts, but there is a very, very blurry relationship between the two. Um, I see Hester's hand is... Yeah, Gilly, can I ask you to um, put that reference into the chat? Sure. And also, John, uh, you didn't pitch your talk that you sent to me earlier. I put it here in the chat, which is in some ways related to what we're discussing today. And also, they, we had some uh, brave students who wanted to ask a question, so we should keep some space. And I'm conscious of that two, um, two questions in the chat. So, Hester, after you. No, it's just, I suppose, the kind of rewilding conversation. I think that idea of wild and wilderness as a kind of a poetic and an imaginative term, which I, I think relates to kind of what you were saying, John, the kind of short story. It's really interesting how it's interest, entering discourse around growing in green spaces and replacing maybe terms that are things like sustainability, but where there is so much less kind of poetry and less um, in some way uh, imagination within that term of where it takes you or what you understand by that. Um, and I think, yeah, this idea of the the contradictions of wilderness, I think, are really interesting of can we ever be wild? And that's actually something to really enjoy at the moment that we've got this kind of term bouncing around that can't easily be tied down or controlled. Um, uh, um, and kind of asks maybe it more to be constructed and can be constructed by you know, a wider group that everyone has a kind of response to wilderness in the way that maybe when we talk about ecology, a certain type of, you know, a kind of person might feel very empowered and someone else might not. But, and I think that's quite, yeah, an interesting feature of it as a world. Thank you very much. I quickly want to give the students a chance to butt in before I read out the message from the chat. Oh, so much pressure. I think, uh, yeah. 
Ah, they're all in one room, look. <laughs> well, that's a proper wave. Thank you. You have to speak up, we can't hear you. Um, can you hear that, yeah? Yeah, speak really loud. Okay. Um, a little a little kind of divergent question um, for both Billy and Hester. Um, kind of the majority of the talks considering nature in an ecological sense, but kind of thinking from an architect's perspective in terms of uh, the social and cultural implications as well when you, um, I'm thinking particularly about the Rubin project in, in Hackney with the Moss Wall and also with the 72 hour urban action um, work of Gilly, which it might be worth kind of um, overarching. I kind of suggest that uh, we're talking about the resilience and also the fragility of nature. And I think that's the same in the communities that the, but both of those projects have been kind of supplanted into. How do we make sure that the uh, the actions of architects coming in and um, imposing or suggesting within those fragile communities, potentially fragile communities, how do we ensure like the ethics of care that we're talking about um, are implemented in that, that design to make sure that uh, it's only a positive change and not potentially damaging? Um. I think the question wasn't just for me, right? Or should Hester, do you want to go first or? Uh, yeah, can do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I think, yeah, I think ethics occur really important and um, to navigate and consider. In some ways, I think any action you have to feel and think through its creation and destruction and it inevitably will have positive and negative effects. Um, uh, and maybe, and I don't, I think there is maybe no protection about, for, you can't protect yourself from that kind of lev level or type of destruction if you are proposing a, a change or a disruption, which I think a design inevitably does. Um, so maybe it's less about not, um, not causing harm and more about being aware and critical and bringing your attention to the harm that you are causing to feel that harm. Um, uh, so I suppose, uh, you know, in a sense, there is a kind of there is a ecology at play existing, and you will you will inevitably disrupt that. Um, I think, in terms of urban, something that I found really useful, and I I think is really important within my own practice, um, is a commitment to taking my time and taking things slowly and not implementing anything too quickly. Um, and that, as a practice, I think um, is uh i think is really important so when harm when you're can be you have the time to reflect and feel the, the harm or the destruction you might be causing all the the positive effects of what you're doing and then change and and be open to disrupt the project based on that um and then i think the second thing is also about the, the type of conversation you you host so that slow conversation happens with a a, a group that is um diverse, is interdisciplinary, has different understandings of the world and situation in which you're engaging. So I suppose a very specific example within Rurban, um, there are the sort of residents of the estate who have local knowledge, um, who, yeah, you kind of, we look, um, I look to um, in terms of their understanding of the local area from kind of their everyday use of it. There is um, kind of scientists within the sustainability department. So Richard, who I work with, um, whose work focuses on biology, but also um, more widely, um, uh, Stuart who also looks at kind of air quality. And so inviting that as maybe as a kind of voice to a discussion. Um, then there's also the local authority, Poplar Harker, who have kind of, uh, you know, are in a position of power within the local area um, and are kind of affecting change at a sort of urban scale. So, um, yeah, I think to summarise, yeah, my two, two approaches would be doing it slowly and inviting a diverse uh, kind of voices to discuss actions that take place and allowing those discussions to disrupt the project. Is, is that a good time for, I think it's quite nice that one of the points is about taking care and taking time with the um, response because um, it's in kind of stark contrast to the methods of 72 hour urban action. So <laughs> is it worth <laughs> and mentioning kind of what that is and then also how because I mean, it, there's, there's in the um, the book, The Love Tactic, which is about 72 hour urban action, there's 
uh, this kind of uh, an ad admission that a lot of the um, there's a range of success in the the proposals, and some of them do aren't, aren't successful essentially in the residents asking them to be removed. So, um, and I think that's quite important as kind of uh, a marker that sometimes it's not successful. But I, yeah, Gilly, Gilly, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for having the book. That's really nice. <laughs> Um, yeah, 72 Hour is a festival that takes a year and a half to produce. Um, so it does culminate in a very quick action, but there is, uh, when the teams are coming on site, there is always um, a neighbor that we call an angel um, to insert the team into a local context. And we do a lot of research and with together with the mission brief, we provide uh, as much context and as much uh, access to local resources, both knowledge and physical resources that we can um, provide within a year and a half of production. Um, so the idea behind 72 hours is that um, pro prototyping in one-to-one -one scale is available. It's not expensive. It's a good design technique. It connects you to the residents. It's an amazing communication tool. In, and it gives you an immediate response as to what they like and what they don't like, what works and what doesn't work in that space. And it's, um, that's the kind of main suggestion within 72 hour urban action. It's definitely not a suggestion that you can solve any issue so fast. Um, so if, it's, it's um, yeah, it, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? It's not that you're supposed to design and build everything that needs to ever answer any kind of question within one weekend, but more that you could use this tool to prototype, to prototype in collaboration um, with the people around the site um, and to try and take those prototypes with a pinch of salt to say it might work, it might not work, and it's equally valid if it doesn't. Uh, and more than anything, it's kind of a reclamation of a certain scale of design production and placemaking. Uh, so to say that we work in microsites where they're too big, they're too small for a developer to care about or the city to renovate, but they're big enough for the community to make use of. There are pockets of neglect that could that have potential to serve a certain social activity within public space. And so we also want to address those kind of scales within a city uh, to bring those scales into the hands of local residents and to make those set of tools more widely available. Um, so it's not about solving things fast, but uh, it's about using design thinking and prototyping in order to kind of promote more uh, activity-based approaches to negotiating these kind of spaces. Hmm? <laughs> okay. Great, thank you both very much. There's a question in the chat from Michael Parrish. Do you, Michael, do you wanna um, um, say it verbally or should we read it? Easiest. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I you have to speak up. Maybe come a bit closer to the to the TV, so we can see as well, not just one pixel. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. I had a question for Hester about um, the like public perceptions of moss and how that might affect the potential of your research and what people think about it. Because I think I have always viewed moss as potentially like as form of growth as perhaps a pest and people try and get rid of it in their own homes and perhaps how that would affect if you're trying to grow moss in urban areas, people might not want it there and how that might affect your research. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's been something um, I've been really interested in and if you Google um, moss, kind of growing moss, all that comes up is like how to kill moss in your lawn or like um yeah methods to get rid of moss out of your out of your garden and i think again there's a really interesting link between the, the sort of growth of moss and a perception of a neglect and the lack of care um which i think in a way I, I, that that tension between in a way actually the moss caring for us and improving air quality is quite interesting um so yeah every every workshop i've done um 
when I've talked about going on a moss walk and we'll find some moss, everyone has said, oh no, we don't have any moss here. There's no moss in our playground. There's no moss in the community garden. This is a moss free place. And then we go on a walk and we find little bits in the cracks and the crevices just kind of like still surviving. So that perception and that kind of pride at a lack of moss is definitely something that um, I've been really aware of. I think um, in some ways, though, I mean, I haven't really talked about it in this talk, but the, the prototypes I've been developing, the moss wall and the moss, moss bench, and then the uh, like uh, clay lanes moss uh, kind of walls in Cardiff, that's a kind of very visual and obvious form of kind of moss and trying to show it as this thing that's kind of positive and um, how we think about it improving air quality. But actually, in reality, you know, if that also then stops people from clearing moss out of their gardens that would improve air quality as well so there's this kind of almost like a, a passive I mean in some ways a sort of rewilding of a retreat of saying this isn't a kind of a negative example of you not caring for your garden this is actually something that's really positive and important for the environment and if you you keep this species and you don't get rid of it you can um, you'll be making a really uh, a really positive um positive impact so yeah no I often feel quite like a, a moss cheerleader of just trying to get people to look and see what already exists um and to see some moss grows over the winter so winter is this kind of green lush time when moss is growing when nothing else is and how we can kind of shift our, pers our perspective on what species we like and we look for and we care for and what species that we kind of overlook I'm really conscious of time thank you so much Esther and there are two more questions maybe we can take those and then um, bring the session to an end and listen to some radio for those who, who are sitting at the desk and have time to listen. So there's a question from Diluj. Uh, hi, Gilly. Uh, do you want to read it? Um, shall I read it out in my kind of German accent? Okay, I go for it. Uh, hi, Gilly. Really enjoyed the presentation and the Climate Care Festival. My mic is not working, so dropping my question here. When looking at reforming from the point of view of national parks and environmentally protected sites, Nature not only needs to be tamed, but humans need to be out of it, which only exacerb exacerbates <laughs> sorry, this human nature divide. Or they become a symbol of power for humans over nature as these sites then become tourist attractions. How do you go across retaining a positive nature culture when preserving these sites or ecosystems on a larger scale? If, I don't yeah. know if you have an answer, but maybe you have a... Have a sense of yeah um i think the whole i think um john was touching up in his comments before um the whole discourse of preservation uh is problematic if we want to move forward um away from this division and and forward into a, a discourse or a, an ontology um that is in yeah that is more based in observation and based in relational understanding of the processes such as Hester is bringing here, which I think is beautiful to kind of like establish a reading relationship towards this living form uh, that then gives you information backwards and you can design in relation to, I think, um, we have to kind of start establishing a different way to relate to these concepts or uh, different ways to understand our interconnectedness and our relationship and the way we're influenced by these environments uh, and the way that we already have. And we, I feel like we're in the discourse of preservation and conservation. There is huge nostalgia and huge problematic um, politics attached to it uh, with this idea of going back to what was before, which is no longer possible. And we have to let go of that idea um, but also the idea that there is some kind of form of pristine nature out there that we should be seeking and holding on to um, both concepts i think are no longer as relevant um, as the idea of moving forward towards um, um, a, um, a making thinking relay form together with our environments uh, where we learn to communicate with our environment differently. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, when it comes to scale, I think, again, Hester is showing us a very beautiful relationship that has um, a very 
uh, individual scale to it, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Hester. Um, which I think is, an, is a beautiful place to start. But since you're asking about large scale um, uh, environments and also rewilding is usually attached to rural landscapes and these kind of like mega huge um, um, areas, um, I think you're asking about, a, or as I see it, you're asking about a paradigm shift that would also include uh, changing a lot of the social norms we're informed by currently. And then from there, we might be able to go and relate differently um, to the ecosystems that you are uh, talking about, if I understand correctly what large scale means. I don't know if that answered your question, but there are many, <laughs> many questions more from Catalina. Um, yeah, I don't know if maybe we can um, just take a bit more time and maybe I just say thank you to all those. I noticed people have to probably leave and start leaving. Maybe we can keep the space open and keep the conversation open. And I just say a quick thank you to everyone for coming. And we can uh, keep talking if the two of you have time. And then we play the radio. I just want to point out like all the content is also on our website, which you can find here i just put it in the chat so if you want to catch up with the radio in other ways do it here and also please sign up to our mailing list um, um yeah uh, the recorded session will be on that website that i've just put in so maybe we go back to catalina's point mm -hmm. um, i have to scroll up can you see it uh, uh, it touched upon rewilding, or maybe we can invite her what, to what was also interesting about Sandra and Matthew's work is how the species that are sometimes being used for rewilding also had their own global histories, and many could have been non native to the German context, which puts the term rewilding into question. Um, Cooking sections, who are London-based, they have a very interesting uh, research project into Japanese knotwit, uh, which is apparently in the UK, supposedly it's uh, so invasive um, that if you find it on your property, it might devalue uh, your property if you wanna sell it. Uh, so it has market implications uh, as an invasive uh, weed, basically. Uh, and their research project makes a really beautiful um, makes a, a really beautiful comparison between the discourse of native and invasive uh, plant species and native and invasive human species uh, across borders. Uh, and I think that um, this discourse that Catalina is bringing in uh, in her comment is uh, super relevant and fascinating. Um, and I, I do agree that it puts the, the term rewilding into question, and I am very happy uh, to further complexify this term because, as I said before, it's not about rewilding, and it's not about finding a new definition of what wild is, but it's about relationships and how we address them um, differently, in my opinion. I can see Catalina here. I don't know if you want to follow up on this, Catalina. We can't hear you. Well, I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Sorry. No, it was it was more like a like a comment, like following up on these questions of, of rewilding and, and the work that you've done in the floating university and also thinking about Hester's uh, presentation and it's like, the, like this presence and, and that's why I like so much the title of the book is this the botanical city. So it's a, like an exploration of botanical, yeah. Uh, in all its in all its aspects, but I think in terms of rewilding, yeah, I think it's a it's a con it's a concept as you say that is worth unpacking and also looking critically when it's used, um, yeah, in this in this context. But I, it, it was just more a comment. I think I'd rather give space to more students to to ask questions. And thank you both for your presentation. I would like to invite before we go to the students. I would like to invite Nia in.
there's a whole conversation going on around Nia's project. Nia, do you, would you, are you feeling comfortable to um, speak? Or should I read it out? Can you stay here? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. I'm in a really loud library, so That's I'm good. sorry for the noise in the background. I was asking about um, your thoughts um, on eco-democracy and uh, eco-urbanism, especially in cities like Berlin and London, because I'm currently working on a dissertation project about kind of how we can queer the urbanism up by introducing rights of nature. And I kind of wanted to ask um, you, what do you think, what shape do you think it can take in modern cities? Hester? <laughs> <laughs> Should we flip a coin for this one? <laughs> um, I don't, this is really about democracy so much, but uh, maybe as a quick thought, <laughs> um, I, uh, one thing that's quite interesting about um, in conversation with another researcher who's doing projects around mushrooms um, is the kind of horticulture or the biology, bryology around um, moss, it doesn't conform to sort of um, uh, traditional ideas of gender and structure. And so as a result, as a kind of, as a field of research, it's often um, kind of almost overlooked or sidestepped because of the, it hasn't followed a, a sort of a structural form that already ex exists within society. And again, I think that's really interesting when we think about kind of, the relationship between nature and culture that actually our understanding of something becomes under under researched or underrepresented because it doesn't conform to existing kind of pro, um, protocols or understandings of structure um, and so um, um, and that there's a sort of I mean I think especially with mushrooms at the moment are kind of returning or a, a looking with more care and energy um, at these species that don't don't conform and why it is that they haven't conformed and how that might inform uh, our social structures by kind of thinking about why the the sort of science of of how they are and how they sort of disrupt our idea of um, of, of structure. Yeah, I totally agree. Ecosexuality is a very interesting uh, preterm maybe to eco democracy. I'm also not an expert in eco democracy, but um, at the floating, we've been exploring a little bit um, this idea of environmental personhood, which is kind of unfolded under rights of nature, um, where it's actually a construct that comes from corporate law because the first uh, non-human identities that needed representation in a court of law were actually the church, the state and corporations. And so when legal experts found a way to give personhood to non-human um, structures, they were um, um, usually not very natural, as you say, cultural construct. Um, and then environmental personhood came out of that when uh, a lawyer in uh, the States, I think in the 70s, uh, Christopher D. Stone, uh, came up with the idea to suggest um, that uh, certain elements of nature or certain natural elements, such as a river, a mountain, uh, a park, um, a reservation, could have personhood representation within a court of law. Um, to have a structure to protect its rights. Um, and we, we in the Floating University, we want to take it one step further and say, what if we declare this environment that is not natural, or at least by, um, let's say, traditional definitions is not natural, but is natural, and try to enforce an environmental personhood on it? what would the basin be if it was an environmental personhood and how would it be represented in a court of law? Uh, but we have to uh, remember that rights of nature are is a field that is working within a conversation that I hope we're trying to change. Um, and so when we talk about rights of nature and we talk about political and legal representation, to natural elements, uh, we're talking about sustaining the same systems that, and the same norms that have brought us to where we are today. 
And we're also talking specifically with rights of nature, um, with constructs that could end up serving um, all, all spectrums of politics. So there have been kind of uh, extreme right-wing um, appropriations of this construct in order to push away certain um, communities from certain environments under the guise of protecting its biodiversity. Um, so it's, uh, let's say it's a, it's a two-way sword, uh, rights of nature. Uh, and so again, case by case scenario, we have to really look at, at the case and, and try to understand what are the politics behind claiming rights of nature uh, in those situations. But there is potential there for fighting the current fight um, while, while working to change the fight altogether. Thank you very much. We have two more questions and then I think we'll draw, draw to an end. So uh, thank you all for bearing with us. So maybe I go to Antoinette first and then to Antonia. Um, um, Antoinette, do you want me to read it out? Do you feel comfortable to... to, to... Um, I'm happy to read it. Oh, you're very far away. We can't see you. I can't see you. I can't hear you. I think you're coming closer. Hello? Yeah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, my question was basically, okay, so first of all, thank you, Hester and Gilly for your presentations. I really enjoyed them. Um, so my question is for Gilly, and I just wanted to ask how working with art, artists in residence and cultural producers and designers um, for creating spatial interventions in the microsites, um, how that engages with the wider community that you're, I guess, working with or catering for. Um, and when you do have these 72 hour um, interventions on the site, is there like a longer term um, intention, say if an idea does work to continue it or preserve it or essentially hand it over to the community for them to continue? Yeah. Yes, I also see your other comment that you were building the floating university. Yeah, I uh, had the week off and my friend who study, was studying at a design academy in Eindhoven was in town working on the project. So I essentially uh, <laughs> helped build uh, the bathtub, uh, okay. the foot bath for the bathing ritual, which was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you should come back. It's very different since uh, 2000. Yeah, so, yeah, it looks great. Um, to answer your question, um, within 72 hour urban action, as I said before, it takes us a year and a half to produce it. Within that year and a half, we talk to a lot of the residents and we see kind of the effects in, in three different ways. Uh, one is that we build a local network. So we always have local production and we always bring um, local actors around the festival to facilitate different parts of it. Um, for example, for the last edition where Andreas was also on the jury, by the way, um, we brought together a lot of local clubs um, and helped them kind of identify pockets of potential within the neighborhood that they were already working and to draw their activity into public space where it's more visible to more residents. Um, but also we have managed to create a working group around the festival that was for, uh, that it was part of our intention, non-successful this time, but have worked uh, in various editions in the past um, to keep those partnerships going and to keep them going formally even after the, uh, the festival is over. And so it creates a different network within the neighborhood uh, for every kind of cultural activity to be able to be uh, facilitated in public space, uh, which makes it more accessible. Um, and then we also work with specific neighbors for specific sites. So 
there is usually a network of microsites, usually 10. And then there is also the fabrication camp that uh, comes with the festival. So there's 11 sites that the festival moves between and around each site we identify neighbors that are interested in collaborating. Uh, and they are the main source of local knowledge and history in those sites beyond the research that we can do in archives and so on. Uh, and so we try to develop this kind of uh, sense of their ownership or to enhance, let's say, an existing sense of ownership that they have towards those sites by um, giving them a team to work with um, to kind of uh, imagine what is possible there. Um, yeah, so those are two different ways that we try and create um, engagement and participation. Um, but also we try very hard to convince the local authority to see this methodology as a prototype in methodology and to see this um, new network in the neighborhood or enhance existing network in the neighborhood uh, as, a, um, as a partner to work with in future projects. So the idea is that the festival comes as this shining, shining moment that uh, everybody can understand uh, and can relate to and communicate around, but that it's actually uh, just a set of tools uh, to enhance collaboration between local actors um, in a more hands-on uh, way. Great, I'm very, very that, conscious. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Antoinette, for the question. So uh, last but not least, we have Leo and Antonio, who also knows the floating university, Antonio. I just saw you there, now you're gone. And yeah, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Is it working? Yeah, there you are. There you are. Okay. I think there's an echo. <laughs> Wait, can you mute this? I'll go over there. I think I'm going to start there. Hi. Um, so the first question. Um, sorry. Was <laughs> how do you think the water affects the human body? inhabiting the space um, and yeah and maybe connecting to this the question was like how the program and the whole life adapts to this routine of the water and how yeah the cultural program is adapting to the nature behavior yeah that's a great question um so it's a rainwater retention pool which means that when it rains heavily uh, we get flooded uh, and I think I am not the designer of the space, I am a curator, but uh, my understanding is that it was a very conscious design, design decision to not build above the flooding level, but to build under it. So we get flooded out every once in a while. And if we happen to have programmed something, uh, it happened to us in 2019 with the festival, where we just got flooded out of the site, so we had to leave. And we tried very quickly to postpone some of the um, program and make it available the next day. Um, and I think it's an important part of programming on a fully functioning infrastructure that also relates to the weather. Um, and to have this cycle happen in a very natural way, in a very um, easy way. Uh, so yeah, every once in a while, we just get flooded out which is, uh, to be honest, from the floating uh, association members, one of our favorite moments. Um, there are many pictures. I don't have them in the presentation of uh, association members uh, rafting around on the flooded basin. Uh, it can be a very happy moment. Uh, but then when the water goes back down, it's a very active moment because we have to go in and sweep the algae away from the platforms. And it's a very... Um, it's a lot of maintenance. 
um, but it's it's a way for the design to not negate but highlight the function of the space that has preceded us, preceded our present presence on the site. Wow! Well, thank you so much, um, Antonia and Leo, and thank you so much, Hester and Billy, and everyone for still being here. It's really been an enjoyable session. So really excited that we got the first forest uh, lunchtime talks on the road. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for being our pioneers. And just a question to Jessica, who is uh, behind the scene. Do we have time to play the radio? Should I do it? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, you now. So we play this now, and we uh, listen to Cameroon. Uh, and I see you all in two weeks when we uh, go to Colombia with Catalina. Bye, bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Amazon rainforest in the evening time. My name is Cameron. I'm going to be your tour guide for today and I'm going to take you on a little journey between some field recordings, some music, some thoughts, some conversations. Today we will be addressing the topic of culture and community in the forest. We've got some amazing contributors who are going to be sharing their thoughts. There's uh, Fadi Katan, who's a chef from Palestine. We've got Rahul Srivastava, who's an anthropologist from India. And we've got Natalia Favaro, who's a ceramicist, architect and filmmaker from Brazil. We've also got an extract from a wonderful talk by Suzanne Simard, who's a forest ecologist from Canada. The music you can hear in the background right now is from the Baka people who live in the Central African rainforest, which is between uh, southeastern Cameroon, the north of Gabon, and the north of the Democratic Republic of Congo. collections of trees, they're complex systems with hubs and networks that overlap and connect trees and allow them to communicate, and they provide avenues for feedbacks and adaptation. And this makes the forest resilient. That's because there are many hub trees and many overlapping networks. But they're also vulnerable, vulnerable not only to natural disturbances, like bark beetles that preferentially attack big old trees, but high-grade logging and clear-cut logging. You see, you can take out one or two hub trees, but there comes a tipping point. Food grown in Palestine, like anywhere else, shapes not only the culture, but the seasonality, the tempo of life. In Palestine, we're lucky to still have many, many small farmers, many, many foragers, and for each one of us to have, whether it's a 
pot on a roof or a you know, backyard or a small, as we say in Arabic, hakura, um, where we grow things. And our kitchen is rhythmed by these seasons. It's za'atar growing in the hills around Bethlehem and being foraged. It's za'atar growing in a pot. Um, it's all the herbs, the khubbeza, the ilik, the silik, the mluchia. I mean, mluchia is the celebration of summer. That is how important the terroir is for any kitchen. In Palestine, view the reality of occupation. The link to the land becomes different. That link is celebrated. That link is part of our resilience where we are in our land. Zatar is an interesting one because Zahtar's been growing wild in the mountains, in the hills. Um, and I remember as a young boy, I would go off with my uncle and for walks, and then we'd pick Zahtar. And the smell of that natural Zahtar is just something I'll, I'll never forget. Um, and then time happened. Um, our lands have been subject to, like, all over the world, pollution, um, construction, and then the layer of occupation, settlements, bypass roads, all that makes our accessibility to land even more difficult. And from that, then Zatar became, quote-unquote, an endangered species, and therefore the um, Israeli authorities uh, told us we're not allowed to pick it on our own land. Um, and of course, we went on picking it and we went on forging it. Because Zatar is, is an element that, that rhythms you, your day. You start your breakfast with Zaytu Zatar, olive oil. So you take a piece of bread and dip it in olive oil and then you dip it into this mix of dried Zatar that's ground with sumer and then sesame seeds. And then you have za'atar, fresh za'atar over your Lebanon. Again, with a lot of olive oil. Or you do za'atar bread. Um, or you do za'atar and jubna nablusia, white cheese from nablus, bread. Um, you know, nice little fluffy bread. I can smell them out of the oven. Um, or you use zaatar to marinate the meat you're going to be roasting, or to marinate the meat you're going to be barbecuing. So we use zaatar in, in everything. We do salads of zaatar. Um, and I don't think anybody can tell us what to do or not to do on our land, and therefore what the rhythm of our land should be. What, how what grows on the land shapes our food, like it should shape food anywhere else in the world. You cook what grows locally, you preserve what grows locally, and you celebrate what grows locally. I can't cook with fresh herbs that are coming from 5,000 kilometers away. I can't use a vegetable that's been flown and, and had had a massive impact on the environment and, and, and then claim it's something nice. Um, but I think wherever you are, whether you're in Palestine, in the UK, in Italy, in Japan, in India, or in Chile, um, cooking with something that's local, that is grown locally, that supports local farmers, is part of the identity of your kitchen. I keep saying I don't exist without the fabulous farmers, the fabulous foragers that I'm lucky to, to meet, to know, to become friends with. I never pre-order quantities from a farmer. I adapt my kitchen to what they have to offer that day.
وضعوا على فمه السلاسل ربطوا يديه في صخرة الموتى وقالوا أنت قاتل أخذوا طعامه والملابس والبيارق ورموه في زنزانة الموتى وقالوا أنت سارق طردوه من كل المرافق أخذوا حبيبته الصغيرة وقالوا أنت لاجئ يداني العينين Mycorrhiza literally means fungus root. You see their reproductive organs when you walk through the forest. They're the mushrooms. The mushrooms, though, are just the tip of the iceberg, because coming out of those stems are fungal threads that form a mycelium, and that mycelium infects and colonizes the roots of all the trees and plants. And where the fungal cells interact with the root cells, there's a trade of carbon for nutrients. And that fungus gets those nutrients by growing through the soil and coating every soil particle. The web is so dense that there can be hundreds of kilometers of mycelium under a single footstep. In a single forest, a mother tree can be connected to hundreds of other trees. We have found that mother trees will send their excess carbon through the mycorrhizal network to the understory seedlings, and we've associated this with increased seedling survival by four times. Through back and forth conversations, they increase the resilience of the whole community. It probably reminds you of our own social communities and our families. What can we learn from Amazonian communities and the forests around them? The simplicity of life, less materials, less stuff, and also a life outside, more close to the natural environment than between uh, walls and doors and windows. The notion of time that is different from people who live in the city, so it's much more sacred and more, much more related with the light, the sunlight. Repetition is a way of learning, so the repetition of all the process in nature um, and the patience to, to see all this process and realize that there is no pressure in nature, that things occur in their own distinctive way.
It was scholar Suresh Sharma's work on tribal modernity that made me first think in this direction. We are so used to looking at modern possibilities and lifestyles only from the point of view of settled agrarian civilizations and their story of evolution and growth. A story that culminates in this ecological dystopia we are living in today. In such a story, indigenous histories have no place. While forests themselves may be considered worth saving, the people who were traditionally responsible for sustaining forests around the world are treated as redundant. According to Sharma, this happens because in our story, there's only one kind of modernity possible. A close reading of the world, however, reveals many possibilities that could have been. Possibilities that could have prevented us from the environmental mess we are living in. During colonialism, there were instances of indigenous communities in central India who looked at the newly expanding railways in their region as part of a mythological expansion of their own universe. For some of these communities worked with iron and even did sustainable mining in a way that regenerated rather than destroyed the forests. They worshipped iron and could have been partners in the modern project. But instead, their knowledge was devalued, their skills ignored, and they were pushed into being laborers, employed to destroy the very foundations of their lives, the forests. The possibility of a modern world built on the knowledge and worldview of indigenous communities could have created an alternative language of a modern forest-based economy. But of course, that did not happen. Mahua is a flower that blooms on the Mahua tree once a year and generates a resource that indigenous communities all over central India use as food and drink. They sun dry it and store it, using it to encash money when needed and as sustenance during times of scarcity. The oil of the Mahua seed is also treasured by the communities as a health product. During colonial times, this flower and tree became a symbol of the relative independence these communities enjoy. For this very reason, in many parts of the country, the making of the alcoholic drink from Mahua was banned or severely restricted. In some cases, even planting the tree was criminalized. Such policies continue to exist even today. They have not allowed for the growth of a modern, forest-friendly economy around Mahua alcohol, which could have been a great way for many communities and local entrepreneurs to earn a living and contribute to the sustenance of the forest. For Mahua trees need very little water to grow and are native to the land and are known to be ecologically beneficial in many other ways. As a student of anthropology, I, like many others, was introduced to the drink during field excursions in central India and instantly fell in love with it. Like many others, I fantasized for decades about working with communities to produce a drink that would generate livelihoods locally and be the toast of the urban world. A friend of mine in India has made a fairly successful attempt to make and sell Mahua, but is allowed to do so in a very restricted way, mainly because of policies that continue to have a colonial hangover. I decided to step in as well but used a different strategy. Over the last decade, I had become familiar with the rich artisanal traditions that Europe has managed to sustain in the realm of drinks and food products, with the French region playing a particularly stellar role. Through my ongoing partnership as an urbanist with Matthias Echenove, I began to understand the deep connections that placemaking has with local economic lifestyles. This was evident in Mumbai, 
as well as in Geneva, where we have offices. During the course of our work, we met businessman Alexi de Dukla. He is equally at home in India and France and has done some very special social entrepreneurship projects in both places. He immediately understood the value of a forest-based Mahua economy and introduced us to our partner Gilles Labat, with whom we set up a France-based company called MAH, M-A-H, which is our global tribute to Mahua. Through this company for now, we make Mahua in France. Our main purpose is to introduce the drink to a region that has a sophisticated taste for the best alcohol in the world. And we are really learning from this experience. We eventually plan to start partnering with local entrepreneurs from indigenous communities in central India to make Mahua from the home base. The future of the modern world depends on creating sustainable and modern economies around forests and forest products by partnering with communities which have a huge knowledge system that we have so far ignored. MAH is a tiny step in that direction. So far, the kind of response we have received in France and in other parts of Europe has been extremely encouraging. Even the few bars which have already begun to order bottles from us are a huge encouragement and we hope that Mahua gets to be known in this part of the world and eventually becomes a genuine example of an ideal forest-based modern economy in which indigenous communities are central to the process. So that last little piece of singing you could hear there are some school kids from Chhattisgarh in India who are singing about Mawa. It's an amazing recording available on the People's Archive of Rural India, which seems like an incredible resource I've been digging into a little bit recently. So thanks so much to Rahul, thanks to Natalia, thanks to Fadi for their contributions to this show today. I'm going to be joining you in a couple of weeks' time to talk a little bit about music of the forest. But for now, thank you so much for tuning in to listening to The Forest. My name is Cameron, and see you soon.